Happy 4th of July. Thanks for spending your Sunday morning with us. Welcome to Dallas Church. Will you stand with us as we begin our service with worship today?
good morning. Uh, welcome to Dallas Church. It is great to celebrate our freedom as a country today and our freedom in Jesus together. Uh, we're so glad to see you here in the building and for everyone tuning in online, your online hosts would love to chat with you. Uh, feel free to reach out to them and comment as the service goes along. If you're new with us today, at the end of the service, we invite you to come out to our connection table. David is ready to greet you. He's got a welcome gift for you as well. Let's just worship together today. Would you pray with me really quick? Lord Jesus, thank you that we are free in you, and we're free here in America in this great country that we live in. Thank you, God, that we can gather freely uh, to worship you as our Lord and Creator. Help us, God, as we sing, as we have some fellowship, as we shake a hand and see a face again here in the building today, God. Just be with us and help us to be in your presence. In your name, amen. Darkness tries to rule over my bones. Sorrow comes to steal the joy I owe. The brokenness is on all I know. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand. Okay. 
I do love camping. Now, I realize that some people really don't like camping, but I have had some great experiences camping. For instance, the first time I ever rode a horse was at camp. First time I ever rappelled down a rock face, which is, you know, where you kind of lean backwards off of a very tall rock face that slightly dangerous, but also thrilling. I did that at camp. I, uh, I, I saw someone try to walk over hot coals with their bare feet at camp. That did not go over so well for a variety of reasons. But anyway, I saw that at camp. Uh, I think I had my first kiss at camp. Yes, it was a Christian camp, okay? <laughs> and I also really got serious about Jesus when I was camping. And I realized those two things are not exactly equal, what I just said right there. But I got serious about Jesus while I was camping. Camping has always been fun for me. And I know some people just loathe the idea of being outdoors. And I get it. I, I get it. If you're that kind of person, you don't like camping, I get it. I mean, you're dirty all the time. You know, you're sleeping outside. That isn't always the best way to get a great night's rest. Uh, you know, there's bugs, things like this. I understand if that's your view of camping. But I, I still recall... This camping trip that my wife Jackie and I took when we left Oregon and we're headed to go relocate in Nashville, Tennessee, I think we got to about Kansas and we were staying at those KOA places. You know what I mean? Do they still have those, the KOA? But we were just tent camping. And so we were outside, you know, roughing it. And, uh, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, it's like the whole world erupted in, think of a cricket sound, but take it up like a hundred times. Apparently, the, the camping trip that we took was at the same time as the cicadas came out. We had never even seen these bugs. We are just like northwestern, you know, kiddos. And these big, huge bugs were crawling everywhere and making huge noise. Actually, we were so scared, we went to the camp host person. We're like, we don't know what's going on. They're like, oh, you newbies. Like they just knew the cicadas were just a part of the deal. But yeah, camping. Uh, look, even if you've had bad experiences, or maybe you're not a camper. We've all had some kind of camping experiences, but I guarantee you, you have not had the camping experience that we're going to talk about today in the book of Numbers. If you have a Bible or a device, start finding the book of Numbers. We're continuing in our series, Torah. We're in this series. We've been looking at the first five books of the Bible. We've used different terms for that, the law of Moses. That's how Jesus in, his, in the first century would have known it. But it's basically the first five books of the Bible. It's been called the Pentateuch, which is a word for five. And, uh, and, and for our purposes, Torah, law, in, in law, in, in a sense for the Jewish thinking, was something that was a guidance for life. So they looked at these books as a guidance for life. And we've been in this series now for a while. And, uh, and, and the hope is that you'll know how all of these books not only work together, but how they point to Jesus. That's why we called this series The Law That Leads to Jesus, because it all points to Jesus. And why is that? Because cover to cover, we believe that this book is the experience of God's people and the experience of God's love all the way through to Jesus. And we believe it's a, a singular story for that. And so today we are going to be talking about camping and one of the worst, craziest camping trips ever. Uh, I'd like to pray here in a minute if you want to bow your head with me. Uh, folks that are online, glad you're with us today. We are one church worshiping Jesus together, and hopefully uh, we're going to hear from God's Word uh, as we get into today's uh, message in Numbers, and we're going to find out that every name matters to God. Let's, let's, let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word, for the things you're going to teach us today. Father, help us to have soft hearts and open ears. And Lord, may you uh, challenge us by the power of your Holy Spirit, everybody in this room and online, that we would, we would uh, hear from you and put into action what we hear. And Father, we're thankful that you, you love us so much, more than we could possibly imagine. We lean into that love today as we look at the scriptures. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, so find the book of Numbers. Here it is in my handy-dandy, the good old-fashioned ESV. Numbers, find the book of Numbers. These books, I know, can be a bit intimidating. And we've already seen that so far. In fact, last week, Andrew talked through Leviticus, clearly one of the challenging books to read through, especially if you've ever tried to do uh, read through the Bible in a year deal. You hit these speed bumps. You get to Leviticus, and you're like, oh, my goodness. Numbers isn't much easier. However, there's some, cool, there's some cool stuff that happens in the book of Numbers. There's basically five sections to the book, 
Okay, this is just a 30,000 foot view here. Five main sections to the book. We, we have three wilderness areas, and then we have two travel logs between those areas. Now we're starting out at Sinai where they've been already for a long time, and, uh, and then they, they're gonna have some travel to the next wilderness area, which is Kadesh, and then they're gonna travel again right before they enter the Promised Land. They're gonna be in the plains of Moab, right near the Jordan River, north of the Dead Sea. So that's kind of the area that we're talking about, and, and that's the time frame and the sections laid out in the book of Numbers. And yes, Numbers is a good name for it because there are a lot of numbers in it. Chapter 1 and also chapter 26 are census counts specifically of men of fighting age. And that's going to be important because there's going to be some conquest that has to take place. So there's a, there's a head, head count so they know kind of how the army's supposed to move when they're marching orders and things like that. So we have two counts. That's why most of your English Bibles will say numbers. But actually, from, from a Jewish perspective, the book is called In the Wilderness. And let me see if you can figure out where I get that from. Here, here's Numbers chapter 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel by clans, by fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male head by head. So we're going to get this count, literally a count. And you're going to see at the end of chapter 1, you get about 600 or so thousand of those fighting age men. So we'll talk about that number in, in a little bit. But whether you call it numbers or you call it into the wilderness, we're going to be looking at a, a crazy experience of God's people through some wilderness areas. So let's walk it through. This is a map of the area because some of us aren't super familiar with this area of the world. Remember, we talked about five sections, right? Three wilderness areas and two traveling between the areas. So if you, if you, got a, you might have a study Bible. It might have this in there. Uh, let's just kind of walk through here. I'll, I'll go on this side. So at the very top left, you have Ramses. You see it up there? Ramses up there. That's where we think, that's where we, we think they left from. And, so, and, and some of this is a little bit hard to follow because we don't get a, a complete you know, travel log of all the spot, uh, spots on the way. But they started up here, all of God's people, and they, they're jettisoning out of Egypt, and uh, they plundered the people as they went, which is kind of nice. They're carrying some extra gold. And they're headed down. They start at Ramses up here in the upper left. And then they come down to, see that Red Sea? It sort of has that, that, that uh, left-leaning uh, spine there. That's the Red Sea. We think that they might have crossed around Marah. It's got a question mark there. That's why. We think that maybe that's where the Red Sea event happened. And then they cross over into the wilderness of Zin. And it kind of looks like a, like, a, like a triangle. You see, kinda, it's hard to see on the, the map, but you get kind of a triangle. So, the, so they spend a lot of time there at Mount Sinai toward the bottom of that triangle. And, uh, and so that's where we, we start the book of Numbers, but we've already been there since mid-Exodus. So they're there in this area of, of the world, and they've been there for, like I said, we're pushing a year at this point. They left Egypt, and they've gone across the Red Sea, and now they're down there in the Sinai area, and we're there for a good nine chapters. So if, if we haven't already said it enough, they spent a lot of time at Mount Sinai. Now, a lot of things happened there. We got the Ten Commandments, all that good stuff. Remember those autographed originals of God's handiwork, and then Moses gets mad and breaks them. That was a sordid deal, the golden calf thing. All of that happens there at Sinai. But they're there. We get the first of two head counts, right? We just talked about that. Counting the fighting men. And then they get some marching plans, how we're going to actually march into the promised land. Again, that's important for military strategy. So that we're, we're getting all that, and then they're, 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 at the end of chapter 9, they're ready to start moving. And uh, in, in chapter 10, we get the travel. So they're going to leave Sinai, and they're going to head up to that spot up here. It says Kadesh Barnea. You see that spot? Now, now remember, part of the reason why the names are kind of hard to follow is because sometimes they had the same name for the same region. Now you think, well, that's crazy. Those weird ancient people. Well, hold on a minute. Are you in Dallas? Or are you in Oregon? Or are you in the Willamette Valley? Or are you in Polk County? Yes. 
right? So it, it's not odd to us that we may have several names for the same spot of land, right? But they're heading out. They leave Sinai at chapter 10 of Numbers, and they head northward. They get all the way to Kadesh Barnea, which is knocking the door on the bottom southern part of Canaan, where they're going to, that's going to be the land they're going to have. That's what they consider the promised land. So they're going to be marching uh, from Kadesh and eventually to uh, get to the next section, which is the plains of Moab. We'll talk about that in a bit. So what happens? They're traveling, right? They leave Sinai. Finally, they get three days into the trip, and they're grumbling. Are we there yet? Can you imagine how many times they heard that one? Are we there yet? This is so boring. So long. They didn't even have smartphones back then, it turns out. So the kids are just like losing their minds. There's nothing to do. Oh, let's throw a stick. Oh, that's fun. They're, 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 they're moving. Things are not, people aren't happy. And they start grumbling three days in. Three days in. That's it. They make it three days. They're grumbling and they want meat. And so God gives them some meat and then strikes down a bunch of them. I know that's a sordid tale. It's not very politically correct, but that's kind of what happens. God kind of takes out some, uh, some, some anger against their, their rebellion. So they get three days in. God gives them meat. There's the whole judgment of that. It's quail. I don't know if you've ever had quail, but it's a bit gamey. Anybody not have quail in here? Okay, a few of you haven't had that. Okay, well, next church potluck, maybe we'll roll up some. some. Maybe have a little uh, manna type stuff. I don't even know. <clears throat> three days of the journey, God gives them that. Then they march again. So that's good, right? They're, okay, we're, we, did, we dealt with that three-day grumble. We're good. So the, off they go again. And then some close associates of Moses decide, you know, we don't really like Moses. So his brother Aaron and Miriam, they say, you know, we don't really like him. We, we don't even, he didn't even know where he's going. He didn't have a map. His GPS is all off. We don't think Moses is the guy. So that's not good. So then, so then Moses... Is, is having to like stand up for this rebellion with his close associates. And, and, and God basically in that exchange just said, I choose Moses. Moses is my guy. You're not going to lead. They, they were trying to you know, take over leadership. And God makes it very clear, Moses is my guy. He's going to be the one, not you, Aaron, not you, Miriam. So that all happens. So whew, another bad situation. God shows his favor to Moses. And so they finally get to Kadesh Barnea up there. Kind of in the upper uh, right section there of the map. You see the arrow kind of stopping there. Why do we stop there? We stop there because some spies are going to be sent ahead to scout out kind of the left side of the map there at the very top, you see Canaan. So they're going to scout out that whole area, which is where they're supposed to end up. This is the promised land that everybody's been waiting for since Abraham. Right? So they send some spies, uh, and, and a couple of them bring back some, well, they all actually bring back a pretty good report. There's, there's fruit, it's good, the land is good, all good, but only two of the spies we're confident that this is the land God's going to give to us. The rest of the spies are like, yes, it's all good, but they have giants and they're going to hurt us. So then people are like, what? And so now they grumble again, which, you know, grumbling isn't good. We'll talk more about that. But now the people are like scared now. So, so God led us this whole way. You can just see this going on. So you're telling me that God led us all the way here just to get right up to the promised land and we can't take it because there's these giants with, with big sticks. And a couple of the spies were like, no, 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 no. A couple of those spies, by the way, are Joshua and Caleb. And they both said, no, no, we can do this. With God's help, we can do this. I mean, he, he parted the Red Sea, didn't he? And he routed Pharaoh's army. Then they're like, and? And he's like, no, he's got the power to do this, right? Well, the people grumble because they're afraid now. They, they get scared. They're not sure what to do. They're there at camp. Mutiny erupts. And, uh, and, and God is eventually going to send that generation on a 40-year camping trip where most of them die off. You thought you didn't like camping. Uh, they were the definition of not happy campers, actually. That's probably where that came from. They were not happy. But God sent because they were all grumbling. Now, it's interesting. Now, it was probably about 38, 39 years, but we'll round it to 40. Numbers are kind of interesting because in the Bible, you have several repeated numbers, three, seven, 14, 1,000. And in many ways, from a Hebrew mindset, those numbers were like numbers of completion. So isn't it interesting that the nation is kind of floundering there in the desert of Kadesh Barnea up there, and, and they're, they're kind of wandering around, and, and, and they're just, they're, they're angry, they're grumbling, they're tempting, or they're, they're getting tempted, and they're just sinning. All kinds of things going on. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, 
right after he's baptized, goes off into the wilderness. For how many days? Forty. And he's tempted in every way, and he does not sin. And when he, when he is tempted and Satan's trying to get at him, he quotes the Old Testament, specifically the Torah, to fend off the temptation. Interesting use of 40, right? 40 years in the wilderness, they couldn't quite do it. Jesus does it 40 days perfectly. Now, you may wonder, because really, like Numbers 14, if you just grab Numbers 14 and go to the end of the book, it's a 40-year journey that should have only taken two weeks. We're talking about 150 or so miles. I mean, they're on foot, so it's not super fast going, but that should have only taken two weeks. So scholars, they're not quite sure of the route that happened after that rebellion with the spies. They kind of wandered around. Maybe they went back down to the Red Sea and to reminisce. I don't know. But they're there for 40 years. And, you know, that first generation's dying off. The generation that saw God do all those miracles, they were the grumblers. And God's like, you're, you're, you're done. I'm going to go with your kids. So that, that all happens in the same area here. And you may wonder, that seems like a harsh thing. Why would God do that? Well, look, we know that God used Moses to bring the people out of Egypt, right? That's a, that's a foundational story for the nation, right? They, they were rescued from the evil Pharaoh and taken out. Well, well, they'd gotten out of Egypt, but Egypt hadn't gotten out of them. See what I mean? Egypt was still in there, and God needed to get that out. And yes, he used a crazy, horrible camping trip to do it, but that, 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 that generation would, would eventually die, die off. Uh, so then, after that happens, so that now we get to about Numbers 20, if you're following along, and then you're like, wow, this is crazy, sort of tale. Number 20, they start traveling again. And remember, they've got their marching orders because God told them how to march and everything. So now they leave, you know, wherever they were at, ended up, they, they, I think they, they begin to, to go now, they're heading up to Canaan. But a couple of these countries, you see the, 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 the right side of the screen, you have Edom and Moab. And uh, they really didn't want the Israelites walking through their front yards. So they said, you can't go through here. So they had to kind of skirt really to the east of that. And they're going to end up kind of above where the map stops, north of the Red Sea, right by the Jordan. That's how Numbers is going to end with them ready to go into the Promised Land. So no, the, the book of Numbers ends in the plains of Moab. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mountain there that God offers to, to Moses to stand up on so he could see the land. But Moses, we're going to talk about this here in a second, but Moses isn't going to be able to go in with, the, with everybody because he makes kind of a colossal mistake, which we'll talk about. So they're there at the plains of Moab. They take another census. Why did they have to take a second census? <laughs> yeah, we had a... A bunch of people die. A lot of funerals. I don't know how many people would, would have to die every day. I don't know. You got millions of people. A crazy thing. So they have to take another census. And if you look at uh, Numbers 1 and Numbers 26, both those chapters, the, the counts are pretty similar. Maybe a couple thousand off. But they are actually pretty, pretty similar. And so they're there. They've taken a count. They're, they're, they're getting assembled because they're, they're going to go into the promised land now. So they're getting ready for this conquest. They are ready. The old generation's gone. The younger generation's there. You got Caleb. You got Joshua. They've already spied out the land. We're ready to do this with God's power. And then God will restate a blessing that he gave to their earliest forefather. He will remind them of Abraham. And say, uh, you're going to be a blessing to all nations. This is, you're, you're a blessing sort of people. And so he, they, they get reminded of that that was originally given to Abraham. And here's the weird thing. Weird, Bible, I'm going to Bible nerd out for a little bit. So they're there at the plains of Moab, just above where kind of the map ends. You'll see Moab up there at the, the, the far right. Just above that is kind of where they were parked at for, for, for a while. This, that's that, the third wilderness area. While they're there... In the area, there were some Moabites and some people like that. And the Moabites decided, you know what? I don't, we don't like these people. You know, they were trying to walk through our front yard. You know, I watered it really well. I don't want them walking through my ornamental grass. So, so the, the Moabites were not happy with these Israelites. And so they thought, well, we're going to hire a professional to curse them. So they're going to hire a professional to curse the, the people. And, and so they, they gather the money. They find this guy named Balaam. You might have heard his name. 
He's a professional prophet, and they're going to use him to curse the nation and have God's wrath come down on him. Uh, now, I don't know if you know much about Balaam, but Balaam was this seer, this, this kind of interactor between the gods and everything like that. And, and God is going to actually use him in a unique way. Now, remember, Moses was kind of the people's prophet. I mean, Moses was the guy. And so if anybody should be blessing the nation, it should be Moses. But watch what God does through this guy, Balaam, who was, again, paid to curse a nation. He was paid to write a nasty song against Israel. That's what he was paid to do, right? That's setting that up for you there. Here's a nerd moment. So Balaam, son of Bor, that's who God uses. They did an archaeological dig several years ago now in a dig site called the Deir Allah in Jordan. And they found an inscription on a piece of pottery from the 8th century B.C., 800 years before Christ, seven, 800 years, somewhere in there. And, and the inscription says, Balaam, son of Bor, a seer of the gods. This was a real person on a piece of pottery. The guy was famous enough to have his own coffee mug. <laughs> so he, he, he's paid, Balaam is paid to curse the nation. And if you know the story, he goes consulting with God, and God's like, you ain't going to do that. Let me read what, what one commentator said about this. So Balaam is Moab's answer to Moses, right? Moab's the country there. They don't want these Israelites. We're going to use Balaam. He's our guy. Balaam is Moab's answer to Moses, the man of God. Balaam is this internationally known prophet who shares the pagan belief, listen to this, that the God of Israel must be just like any other deity who can be manipulated by acts of magic and sorcery. That's what Balaam's thinking. He was very wrong. Yahweh don't play like that. The one true God is very, very different. When paid to curse God's people, God uses Balaam to bless the nation. Not once. Anybody know how many times? Haven't we talked about 7 and 3 and 14? These are numbers of completion blesses them over and over and over again. A pagan prophet blesses the nation of Israel. It's one of the most remarkable, I think, sections in the Bible. Okay, so at, at each of these wilderness areas, so remember the three, we got Sinai. We're very familiar with Sinai. Now they spent a lot of time in Sinai. Can we get out of that place first, please? So they're there for a year, then they move forward to Kadesh. That's the, the, your Bibles might say wilderness of Zin, something like that. So they were up there. We don't know how long exactly, except for maybe about 40 years. And uh, they wandered around for a while. Then they finally wind up at the very north part of Moab, on the plains of Moab, ready to go into the promised land, cross the Jordan, and go into there. Every wilderness section has more laws added to to the, the, the whole mix. So they have more laws that they need to do. One of them is the Nazarite vow. You ever heard of the Nazarite vow? That was something that they even did in the New, Te in the New Testament, where they would like shave off all their hair, and then they would like not drink wine and stuff like that for a period of time, kind of like a period of fasting and that sort of thing. Uh, and that Nazarite vow is one of those that was added in, in one of these wilderness sections. So we add some things there. Let's talk about something that scholars have debated and scratched their heads over for centuries. Let's talk about these numbers. All right, so what is, uh, somebody got their Bible open. So Numbers 1, verse 46, how many people does it say we got? And these, again, these are, this is not everybody. These are the fighting men, ages, what, 20 and up. Fighting men, what do we got, 600 and what? Okay, 603, what is it, 550, somewhere in there? Now, if, you, if you're, okay, I'm Bible nerding for a second, okay, it's the same number that they got in Exodus when they finally got to Sinai. So in, in Exodus, um, if you look at Exodus 38, 26, they're there at Sinai, and that was that exact same count. Now, again, 40 years later, they're going to take another census, and the number's going to be slightly lower. And that's in Numbers chapter 26, verse 51. The number's a little bit different, but again, what's happened since that time? Generation of people have died off, so they had to get another count so they would know how to march and put everybody in the right order, and, uh, and they would need to know that. So 
Here's the deal. Some scholars take these numbers at face value. Just, just play this out with me a little bit. If there's that many fighting men, this is, this is where it gets a little dicey, tricky. If there's that many fighting men, you think about how many more people would be there, women, children, older people, right? So there's a lot that isn't part of that count. If you had that many of just that age group, how many people total would you have? See, this is where scholars are trying to scratch their heads. Like, could, could, could that part of, 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 of the world support that many people all on one side? This is where, again, they're, just, they're not sure. They wonder, sometimes because you have numbers in the Bible that are like representative. You know, they're, they're symbolic, right? So some scholars will say, no, we'll take them at face value. There were 603, 550. And that's what we're going to use. Some scholars take that. Others say, well, they're, maybe they're more representative. Maybe they're, say, 6,000 families, all right? So you have some of that going on. I, I don't really know the answer. I tend to trust the scriptures, uh, what it says. But again, I also realize that there's things I, I don't know. But regardless of how you take those numbers, God wanted every person involved in what was next. And, and the reality is, to God, every number has a name, and every name is a person, and people matter to God. So however you take that number, people are special. God knows you. Luke 2, or 12, 27 says He even knows the hairs on your head, or lack thereof, for some of us. He knows that numbers matter to God because those are people. And, and here's the deal. He wanted every person in that generation. Remember, they're, they're, their parents all died out. So they're getting ready to march in. He wanted everybody is involved here. Your name, your number matters because everyone's going to be involved. We need complete participation here. Nobody's sitting on the sidelines. We're all got to do this to take the, the promised land. Does that make sense? All right. Can I nerd out a little bit more? A little bit more? Just a little? So... If you've been paying attention, and some of you have, have, have tried to read through these books, the Torah, the five books of the Bible. Some of you have tried to, to kind of follow along with this. I realize it's a challenge, but you will find some repeated patterns. Let me share with you just a couple of them that are, are, are in Exodus as well as Numbers. And, and you may have seen them already. Here's a couple of them. There's not all of them. Some fun facts for you. Log them away. You might answer it on a trivia show someday. Here it is. In both Exodus and Numbers, we get some advice from Moses' father-in-law. You remember that? In Exodus, Moses was, was trying to do everything for everybody, and his father-in-law said, you know, this is going to wear you out, and it's going to wear the people out. Why don't you pick some good people to kind of make some smaller decisions, and anything that gets really crazy, you can make that decision. So his father-in-law helps him there. He does it again in Numbers. In fact, the one in Numbers, Moses is like, why don't you just stick with us for a while? And he's like, appreciate the offer, but I'm going to go home. So two, two parallels there of getting information from his father-in-law. What does that tell us? Some of us that are younger here, some of us are older here. You know, some of us younger people, we can get some good information from people who've been living a little bit longer than we have. You know what I'm saying? There's some, some older people in here that have much more wisdom than I have. It's good to lean in on that wisdom. So that happened in both books. There's also this three-day journey thing. Remember, they were only three days out of Sinai before they start grumbling about meat. There's also a few three-day moments in Exodus where they start complaining. So there must be something about that third day. You know, that third day, they're like, ah, oh, we have to keep going. I want meat. I want water. So three days, manna and quail. Manna, the bread from heaven that falls on the, on the ground that people gathered, and quail both show up in Exodus and Numbers. Some of you might have already seen that. Here's one more. Water from a rock. I don't know why this is such a big thing, but it happened a few times in Exodus and in Numbers. Now, when it happened in Numbers, Moses got into trouble because he hits a rock and he doesn't give God credit. He, he says, do, 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 do I have to keep getting water for y'alls? And that was a problem because he didn't give honor to God. And so that prevented him from going into the promised land. But both of those showed up. There's, there's other parallels, but let me just nerd out on one more thing. Okay, one more, I promise, just one more. I love when they're digging in the Middle East and they find something interesting. I already, I already told you about, about the whole Balaam thing, right? They found his inscription on a piece of pottery. Well, check this out. The oldest fragment that we have of the Old Testament is what's known as Aaron's blessing. It shows up in Numbers chapter 6. I think it's verse 24 through 26. You may think, well, I've never heard that. I bet you have. 
This shows up in some scrolls they call the Silver Scrolls, and they date back to the 7th and 8th century before Christ. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ. And it's on scrolls, which means it goes even farther back. They know if they've got it already circulated on scrolls, it's already been around a lot longer than 7th, 8th century B.C. There's an inscription. I know many of you know Hebrew, so I'm sure you already know what this says. I'll, I'll translate it for you. Actually, somebody else translated it for me, so I'll just read what they say. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Anybody heard that one? The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Isn't that amazing? Found that. That's a really small little thing, too. I think that was in some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, something like that. Just crazy. Uh, but it's confirming. See, those things always confirm to me that I may not understand everything in here, but I can trust it. Pretty amazing. Okay, all right. I, 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 let's move on. Let, let's talk about us. We've been talking about Israel's story, and yes, Numbers is about Israel's sordid tale. We, we got that, Ben. They, they grumbled, and they were wandering, and just, you know, crazy stuff. What about you and me? What about your grumbling? What about your rebellion? What about your mistrust? I, I, I think we've got to address this. We've got to address the heart issue with all of us. Because we look back at these folks and say, oh, those ancient Israelites, they were so primitive. Oh, we would never make those dumb decisions like they did. Kind of acting a little bit snobbish, right? We, we, we wouldn't have done that, but I think we would have. We have rebellious hearts. Sometimes we harden our hearts. So how about you? Would you consider yourself a positive or a negative person? Okay, let me ask that in a different way. If I ask the people around you in your life, if you were generally a glass half full or a glass half empty, empty person, what would they say about you? Are you someone that grumbles a lot? Or do you tend to, to go negative? And maybe that's a hard issue that you need to confront today with the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of one of those negative nannies. I need, to, I need to kind of shift some gears here. Maybe I can look at you a little bit better and not wallow in, in, in things that are so negative. See, Numbers gives us a stern, stern warning. It'd be, like, it'd be like a spiritual, I don't know, check engine light, if you will. Numbers provides us a warning that we got to make, make sure that we don't drift into disobedience, distrust of God, to grumbling. That we don't want to follow the, the ancient pattern that we see in Numbers. We don't want to fall into that trap of grumbling and complaining. It, 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 sometimes we have so much blessing that we don't know what to do with it, so we start drifting negative. What if we were to thank God for those blessings? What if we lived gratefully instead of drifting to the negative? And so it's a stern warning for us. The whole book of Numbers is a stern warning. In fact, several times in the New Testament book of Hebrews, it will say this. Here's Hebrews 3.15. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. You know what rebellion they're talking about? Numbers. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts like they did in the rebellion. We have a role to play in our walk with Jesus. And we've got to be careful to guard our hearts from those things that will twist and, and drift us negative. That we want to take a heed and warning from, from the book of Numbers to watch out for that because we want to follow Jesus by faith and enter into that rest. Now, the, the people of Israel, they were hoping for that promised land. In a greater sense, we are hoping for new heavens and new earth and to enter that rest. And we do that by faith. We don't want to give up. And so this is a, a check engine light for our spiritual life. We've got to watch out that we don't drift into grumbling and disbelief and, and hardening our heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says this, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of our heart. We've got to be careful not to harden our heart. 
Now, the Apostle Paul, early church leader, he wrote a letter to some friends in Corinth, a church there in Corinth in, in the first century. And in 1 Corinthians 10, he uses this same rebellion book of Numbers to warn us. And he said, look, don't, don't drift into the worship of other gods or idols. Don't do that. And he said, don't engage in improper like sexual practices. Don't put Christ to the test. Don't grumble. He's asking us to not harden our hearts and not follow the pattern that we read in Numbers. See, the the reality is this. God will honor your decision. He will honor my decision. He he doesn't force you to obey. He doesn't force you to say yes. He doesn't force you to listen to Him. He offers that as a choice. And He will honor your decision. Do I want to be someone who obeys by faith, or am I going to be someone who's going to grumble? And we will reap the reward of whatever way we choose. See, the Scriptures ground us in a story that's been going on for a long, long time. And it's our story too. I realize that we are not first covenant people, we're second covenant people, that is, under Christ's blood. We're that covenant. But these stories teach us. They give us history. They give us grounding in a story that's been going on for so, so long. We follow the tension between God's goodness and the sinfulness of sin. They ground us in a story that we believe cover to cover is the story of God's love through Jesus Christ. And my hope is that you're learning more of how these books all fit that scenario. Look, here, here's my point today. In Christ, you and I, we are counted for eternity. In Christ, you could just say this, God counts me in for eternity, so I matter in His kingdom work now. That actually God has called you to work in His kingdom now. Jesus said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. We're part of that. And so God counts you and I in for eternity. And we can, we can do his kingdom work now because it matters. So I want you to pray with me. And I, you can pray with your eyes open. Did you know that? So when you're praying, when you're driving, I highly recommend you keep your eyes open. It's a good thing. Let's pray with our eyes open. Let's, let's, I want to put this up on screen. This is our challenge. I want you and I to commit to this today. Here we go. I will serve him with joy. I will not grow weary in doing good, but will work with all His energy to love and change the world for His kingdom come and will to be done. Let's do that one more time. I will serve Him with joy. I will not grow weary in doing good, but will work with all His energy to love and change the world for His kingdom come and His will be done. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the chance to to operate as Your hands and feet in the world. Father, help us to love our neighbor. Help us to love the community that we're in. Father, I pray that You'd help us to work for the good of the place You've called us to be right here in our part of the world. Father, we're thankful that you, you, You warn us, You teach us. And Father, help us to not harden our hearts, but to wholeheartedly walk by faith not grumble and grow weary in doing good, but to be about your work, Father, because you count on us that we matter to you, every one of us. Father, thank you for involving us in your great work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We've come to the time in our service that we call response time. This is an opportunity for us to reflect on the sermon and our week and maybe what the Lord is putting on our hearts. During this time, we take communion and we do this every week to remember what the Lord has done for us. In Exodus 12, we see the institution of the Passover. And this was a rhythm for the Israelite people and it was, a, it was an annual festival that they celebrated to remember that the Lord had brought them out of Egypt with a strong hand. In Luke 22, we see Jesus institute a new rhythm, and that is communion. So in Luke 22, Jesus is speaking with his disciples, and he says this, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, 
And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So we take communion every week to remember what God has done for us and the fact that through Jesus' sacrifice, we are part of a new covenant that gives us life and freedom from sin and a close relationship with the Lord. This time is also equally an opportunity for us to give thanks to the Lord and worship him and surrender to him through our, our giving, our tithes and offerings. So if you feel led to give financially today, you can come up and give through the offering boxes here at the front of the room. You can also mail a check to our PO box or you can give online through the Church Center app or through our website. So I'm gonna say a prayer over us as we move into this time of response. After that, please feel free to come up to the front of the room and, and take communion. And then if you're online, I really encourage you to grab, to grab some juice and, and some bread and partake in this with us as a church family. So let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for you. I pray that you would open our hearts and that everything that we do, Lord, our thoughts, our actions, our words, that we would be led by you in those. God, we thank you for your amazing power and your endless grace because we need it. In your name we pray. Amen. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you.
Thank you that you are always with us. We thank you that your promise still stands. You are always faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Walking around these walls. I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's worth for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence.
Thank you, Ryan and, and team, and uh, it's great to see everybody today. Be safe on 4th of July. One quick reminder, we've got another chance next Sunday, July 11th, after late service for our starting point class. Pastor Ben does a great job of walking through kind of our church story, our history, uh, showing ways you might think about plugging in in Dallas, uh, Dallas Church, and just kind of uh, in general letting you know um, how you might uh, uh, learn more about Dallas Church and, and put some more roots down. If you want to hear more about that, we serve lunch, and you can just come and be a part of that next Sunday, July 11th, after late service. Um, let's go and be the church today. Your promise still stands. 